Christian studies that we're doing on um, how the theology and culture of the Jews became very different than what it was described to be um, in the Bible and what Father purposed it to be as he's described it and revealed it in his word. And um, so today what we're going to do is we're really going to focus in more on the Hellenization of the Jews. I'm, let's look at a 30,000 foot view. The Hellenization of the Jews, which basically began around 334 B.C. and extended all the way out to 70 A.D., and we'll just stop it there because that was the first destruction of the temple. Later on, I'll talk more about Barkova and um, the second uh, you know, destruction, really, of what was left of Jerusalem in 132 A.D., and we'll get on into the, um, the things of the Babylonian period of the second century A.D., and then the development of, of more of the um, Persian religion um, and uh, influences of Babylon later on in the second, third, and fourth century as it AD, um, or if you like, the, you know, uh, the common era, however you want to look at it. I, I, pre I prefer to say AD. And um, then, of course, the final product being um, the rabbinic teachings of today, the Talmud, as we said so many times, and, and showing how that really, uh, once again, how that so many different religions and cultures influenced the theology of Israel, how that they were, how Persia influenced the theology of Israel, how Greece influenced the theology of Israel. Rome pretty much just advocated Hellenization. Um, and Greek culture, more than anything else, more than something really truly unique, different names of gods and things, but then how they were then ultimately then that much more influenced again by uh, Babylonian um, culture and theology, and especially under Zoroastrianism. Uh, I think Zoroastrianism, I haven't really brought this out much, but I'll talk about it later, how Zoroastrianism really impacted the Jews after the second century A.D., so, um, you know, what, so what we'll do today is we'll focus in on the Hellen what we would classically refer to as the Hellenistic period and the Hasmonean period. Now, I know I don't have a lot of handouts for you, but what I expect you to do is I expect you to do your own research. You have these things so available to you. You can Google this, get a lot of stuff on Wikipedia. You know, you've got to be just easy with Wikipedia. It's kind of like an overview, and sometimes information isn't necessarily updated and accurate. But, you know, you'll get to places like you'll get a whole lot of different Judaic sites, Chabad sites, um, uh, different uh, Israeli sites. There's certain spin there. Then you'll get Encyclopedia sites, Britannica, um, Encyclopedia Britannica. And there's other, you know, papers and journal articles out there. Um, one that I wanted to just kind of put down for you because I like older journal articles, uh, especially when it comes to theology. Some of them are still suspect, but I, I can't really put this up on the overhead for you right now, but I'll remember to actually post it on the website, and that would be um, something out of the American, American Journal of Theology. You can have access to the American Journal of Theology and a lot of other theological periodicals, um, some without even having to pay a fee for them because depending on how old the journal is. And then others, you know, just a minor fee. And, you know, you get to get a broad view of, of these periods and how they influence Jewish culture and the total uh, Hellenizing I'm making a Hellenic, Hellenic Jewish culture and community, which was which was a unique species, if you would, to um, the Helen uh, to the Hellenization of the world. But at any rate, um, there is a lot of free journal articles. There's a lot of free information. Some of it you have to be careful with it. If it's not in peer review, you've got to then be able to edit out the things that are valid and what's not valid. And I know that takes a little bit more education, by and large. If it's anything that goes against popular belief in the, in, in, from a biblical point of view, don't believe it. 
uh, and uh, you know, kind of take some of these things with a grain of salt. Josephus is a pretty good source, you know, because he's looked at as the great historian of the period, and was basically closer to in touch with other um, influencers and historians um, uh, than, of course, anybody would be um, after that um, in terms of really being plugged into Jewish culture and how it changed. And he does show how it mm -hmm. changed. So Josephus is cer certainly a really good source. And so what I want to try to do is let's just look at let's look at Ezra and Nehemiah and um, let's look at Malachi and Zechariah and, and, and Haggai and you know Joshua the son of Josedek and Zerubbabel and we see a great group of people there at, at the return of uh, the exile in Babylon and, and their leadership of, of restoring to some degree uh, the kingdom of God culture and uh, the theocracy um, of what now is called Judea. It's not called Israel any longer. After Babylon, it's called Judea. Um, and so um, we already see that the people are a bit slow in responding to God and building the temple. Their hearts are really Babylonianized. They are, ref they are slow of leaving to leave Babylon and come back to Judea or Palestine. And um, then once they get back, they're slow then to respond. The remnant that came, they're slow to respond then in many respects to what God is demanding of them, which we can see in Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. And that's, those are important sources, Nehemiah and Ezra. And so then what we do from that is we begin to understand certain things about the culture around Ezra, Nehemiah, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and and we try to understand that somewhat through the eyes of secular history and Josephus. And we have this group called the Hasidim, or the pious ones. And um, it is believed that from those guys, uh, that from this, this culture that was really radical about seeing the kingdom of God uh, restored within the framework of uh, the... Um, Theocracy and the, the law being the rule of, of Judea, this group called the Hasidim or the pious ones basically being what was in view of uh, the historians such as uh, Josephus. Um, and then we know that by the time we have Janus the priest, and I believe that would be like 332 B.C., he would be the last real legitim legitimate priest that we could say was from the Aaronite priesthood. And it was Janus that came out and met Alexander the Great when he came up against Jerusalem. And it was, you know, at that time... Alexander the Great had a vision or a dream that he was met by a high priest and, you know, according to historical information, the priest came out according to his dream and told him that he would actually go and c conquer the kingdom of Persia. After that, things really begin to go south. And um, although, uh, although we don't have uh, an invasion of Alexander the Great in, and an oppression by Alexander the Great in Jerusalem, the kings uh, that followed him uh, certainly did oppress Israel. And we have it back and forth between uh, Seleucid kings and the Ptolemy kings. And so for a period of time, they're, they're ruled by the Seleucid Empire. Then they're back into you know, uh, the Ptolemaic Empire or the uh, kingdom of Egypt, the reign of those who ruled in Egypt. I think it was like recorded sometime in, in, in just, if this date isn't accurate, just forbear with me, but it's close. I think it was something between the years of 302 and 312 that they calculated that Judea, Jerusalem had changed hands in terms of who ruled over it over seven times, something like that. And so, um, 
you know, there's a lot of back and forth, but bigger than that, there's this ongoing crazy influence that's taking place that is dragging the people of Israel into such an enormous compromises. Um, so even before we get to the Hasmonean period of time, and if you wanted to get, really get a distinction, uh, this is really a, a familiar event for everybody, of where the break would be classic break of the Hellenistic period in Judea versus the Hasmonean period, it would be Hanukkah, or what we call the Maccabean Revolt. And that kind of gives you a distinction right there. So it gives you a, a bit of a separation in time with something that is familiar. But the reality of it is, even though when they returned from Babylon and the Seleucid Empire was ruling over them, Judea was allowed to maintain a theocracy for a long period of time. And that meant that they had a governorship of the high priest and that the law was the rule of the day, um, even though they didn't really have a king. And it's, it's very, you know, the king, king in, is, in Judea is very fuzzy after um, 586, which would be the time of the, uh, you know, the, which would be the time that Babylon came in and overthrew Judea, or the southern kingdom. And so what's happening, though, is we're seeing all kinds of compromises and we're seeing all kinds of acts of, 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 in, of, the, of the Greek culture being imposed upon Israel and, or Judea, and I'm going to show you, show you some of those. And then I think one of the big moments of time would be, this is a switch to the Egyptian empire, Ptolemaic rule over uh, Judea, and that would be the, the second century BC, in which it was now important for there to be the Old Testament written in Greek. And so people are really being Greekized, and 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 you know, after it's like there was almost no contact, as it were, between um, the Greeks and the Jews until after Alexander the Great, and then after Alexander the Great, and after you know the Seleucid Empire, and, and of course. The Ptolemaic Empire was also actually, you know, uh, once again promoting a Greek culture more than any other type of a culture. Um, we, we ultimately see um, several different things happen. Not only are there things like gymnasiums built for Olympic Games inside of Israel, inside of Judea, but now, the Judeans are trying to hide their circumcision. I mean, how can you try, now, well, how do you, what do you mean you try to hide your circumcision? I mean, that's reported classically in history. Well, then they, they must have been running around naked with the Greeks. They were just being that Greek, Greekized. They, they were not only actually having um, gymnasiums, uh, the, the gymnasium built, the gymnasium that specifically that was built in Jerusalem under the tower, under the shadow of the Tower of David, but they were celebrating the festival of Bacchus. And so there was by, you know, by 170, by 180, you've got a lot of Greek culture of, of worshiping other gods. I, one, I can't remember the name of the priest, but one of the priests, oh, actually, that was probably in the Hasmonean period, actually went and sacrificed, and those weren't real priests, and we'll get into that in just a minute, went and sacrificed uh, to the Greek gods during a Greek, during, during an Olympic ceremony in, in, in Athens. And so... I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of various different events within the framework of history that we can look and see uh, that were examples of how much they were influenced by Greek, um, by, by, by Greek tradition and by Greek culture and how much it had changed the culture and the practice of worshiping God and being led by the Word of God. And, um, you know, this all ultimately is going to culminate into the revolt, which will start the Hasmonean period. But there's something else that I want to say, because not only that, but you'll see like around the third century, right, just around, um, you know, 300 B.C., you'll see that there's a great dispersion of the Greeks, of the Jews. Once again, now they're leaving Judea. And so what's going on? Well, what's going on was the Greeks, the Seleucid Kingdom specifically, had granted a particular law 
and I don't recall the name of the law right now, but it's, you know, I'll try to post it, that literally allowed Judeans, Jewish people, to take on the citizenship of another area, another nation, another, uh, another um, providence, a province. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to look in here and see if I might have actually put it in my notes. But the reality of it is, is what it causes. Cause it's it's important because it's it's really the onus of why some would someone would move to Athens or someone would move to Alexandria or someone would move to um, Antioch or you know they would move to another nation or another um, province or or um, uh, place of of influence because then they would become citizens of that area. They would become a citizen of Alexandria. They'd no longer be identified as a Jew. It would afford them more opportunities uh, politically. It would afford them more opportunities financially and socially. And so it was a huge attraction to the people of Judea. Um, I'm still looking. I think it was called, it, it's, it's a, it was called, I think it was, uh, Politomata, Politomata, I believe is what it was called. It was the act of polis for the legal minds that might ring a bell. It was a decree um, and um, that uh, whatever um, township that you lived in, that you could then become a citizen of that township or state. And once again, just it was a huge attraction. I get more money, I get more political influence, I get more social influence. I don't want to be called a Jew, I like to be called a Greek. And that's what was going on at the time. Jews were wanting to identify with that which was most popular in the world that was going to give them, you know, the most social acceptance. Sound familiar? It should. What happens is, though there's a lot of things going on um, from the period of three beginning around uh, 332 B.C. Um, by the time we get to uh, the one we call Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus the... I'll just call him Antiochus the Epiphanes so that we don't make a, a lot of confusion or the fourth, which starts right around 175 and then kind of ends in 164 roughly that period of time. There is now not just a draw to become part of the Greek culture, now there is an oppression to become a part of the Greek culture. Now it becomes illegal to have a Torah, any part of the law, any part of Scripture. Now it becomes illegal to be circumcised because Antiochus Epiphanes is going to, and going to now take it to an extreme. There is no more, there, by this period of time, there is not going to be allowed any kind of a theocracy. But what, what I'm not doing a very good job of, and perhaps I'll be able to do a better job in the next lecture as I'm trying to tie, tie in more of these things, is that there was an abdication over to Greek culture before it, was a pre, before it was imposed upon them. You can see historically where there's constantly giving over and there's compromises like the gymnasiums, there's compromises like the celebration of Bacchus to the point um, that there's compromises by going to other, leaving Judea and going to other nations or other regions or other states so that they could be, have the citizenship of that other region and have, you know, ultimately the benefits of that. That's an abdication. They're willingly being Greekized. They're willingly inviting in um, Greek culture. And so um, then by 170, right around 176, the time the Antiochus comes on the scene, 175, it just continues to increase ultimately until um, <laughs> we have the classic event of which would be the first abomination that makes the temple desolate where Antiochus Epiphanes comes in, cl claims himself God, defiles the temple, defiles the sanctuary, erects, uh, you know, the worship of what would be the equivalence of, of, of Jupiter, the worship of Jupiter in the temple, and that initiates the revolt. A revolt that is led by these guys who are ultimately called the Maccabees. It was a name that was given to them, and it's an Hasmonean, it begins the Hasmonean period. Now the Hasmonean period is going to become one of the worst, it's celebrated as a revival, but it becomes the beginning of one of the worst apostates 
apostate states of Israel. Because now everybody that's in the priesthood has no legitimate claim to the priesthood. They are not Aaronites. And they are going to be opposed by every group that has any kind of consecration to the Lord. Beginning with, of course, as I already said, talked a little bit of, about the Hasidim, which would be, the Hasidim would be the ancestors of the Pharisees and the Essenes. Okay, so the pious ones, so we look at it like this, the guys that had the same heart of Ezra and Nehemiah, the same response to really obeying God and walking with God. I mean, of course, who is more radical than Ezra? I mean, that is one of the most radical books of the Bible to read and to see such a consecration to the ways of the law of God and the rule of God. So uh, the tradition says that out of that came the Hasidim or the pious ones, and then out of that became this other these other political groups. And Pharisee, the Pharisees were, were truly a political group as much as the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were truly a political group that was an aristocracy of the priest. Uh, at least they had some kind of Levitical association. And then you have the Essenes who didn't like either one of them and said you both have basically walked away from God. And so we're going to go out here and we're going to be separate unto God and we're going to pursue uh, true worship of Jehovah. And... Um, you know, so I'm going to spend more time and talk about that, kind of give you a little bit of a lead-in of just watching this thing deteriorate. And what happens is these Hasmoneans, which are nothing more than the descendants of Matthias, who became called Maccabee, Judas, who became Maccabee, etc., all the whole of the family, John, all of these guys ultimately makes themselves not only high priest but king. Okay, is that pretty radical? So there's not a revival going on here. There's an apostasy going on here. And what happens is, is out of this, the three uh, most important sects that arise out of this Hasmonean period and this complete decline of the priesthood and legitimacy of the priesthood and claim to kingship and there is absolutely no record or way to legitimize any kind of descendancy from David. So it just doesn't even work. So do, lots of people have tried to do that. You can go and look at journal articles, like I said, and other review articles, and you can see that. I mean, I don't even think that there's any Jewish site, um, like uh, any Jewish organization, Chabad organization, Hashiva organization that would be online that would claim that somehow any of those who would be classified as Hasmonean kings or Hasmonean high priest had any legitimacy to either. And so under them, what happens is they actually, in, for political advantage, and not only for political advantage, but also for the sake of wealth, etc., they even become more Greekized. Um, and uh, one of the Hasmonean rulers, um, Alexander, he um, ultimately, and I'll show you this later on in the Hasmonean period, because this almost ends the Hasmonean period, he, uh, at the time of Sukkot, instead of the Feast of Tabernacles, instead of pouring water out upon the altar like he was supposed to, he poured it out upon his own feet like he was the deity himself. I mean, so that's how messed, and he's the high priest. He's not only high priest, but he's king. And that's the mentality of the leadership. That's where they're taking Judea. Because the leaders are going to take wh wherever, the, whoever the leaders are, and whatever the leaders believe, that's where they're going to take the people. And especially when it's on the bad side of things and rarely on the good side of things, but especially on the bad side of things. And of course, there was a, an outcry against them, but the outcry wasn't that much. I think Josephus numbers, there was about 6,000 guys who opposed him and, they, and, and he killed them all. So anybody opposes you, kills them all. And then that gets bad and basically he dies. And I'll tell you some more things about the, the, how this developed, uh, hopefully if I don't run out of time, but just trying to make sure I, get these things kind of a little bit tied together. His mother becomes the queen, has power, and uh, then ultimately gives reign and authority over to um, her son. And that's really going to be that moment in time where um, uh, the Roman Empire steps in about 63 B.C. And um, from that time on, you know, after Pompey comes in and takes over from that time on, you could basically consider Judea under Roman rule. Um, however, there's this guy who is an Edomite. 
whose father had great political advantage with Rome and with the Seleucids. And this guy's name's Herod. We call Herod the Great. He's an Edomite, one of the descendants of Edom. Think about that. He becomes ruler of Judea. Yeah, and he's noted for building a temple for God, okay? The temple. He noticed to taking what was left uh, of the temple and now embellishing upon it, making it bigger. But you know what? He also built a great, more lavish temple for Apollo and Rhodes, which there's a lot of history on that. And he didn't stop there. Anytime he had an opportunity to build some lavish structure for some gods, he did so because he was going around collecting as much power as he possibly could through every source and means of religious attachment using religion to, to gain the affection of the people. You know what? That's the oldest religious political trick in the book. If you're a wise politician, you use the religion of the majority to gain the affection of the people. If you can basically juggle several different religious ideas like the, you know, Democrats are trying to do now, but barely even have any affinity to Christianity, but they're still talking about, I'm praying for you, you know. But, you know, then you get the affection of the, the people, and it's really no... There is no commitment there. So there was no more commitment to Herod the Great to the worship of Yehoah than there was to the worship of Apollo and, and so on. And so that's so important to grab a hold of. And what emerges out of this, this, this period of decline that we see going on once we dis what we classically refer to as the 400 years of silence just simply because there's no right, there's no there's no scripture. It's for the first period of time, you look at it, it's the pr first period of time, really, from the days and the time of Moses. It's this long stretch of 400 years where there is nothing come, coming down out of the realms of prophecy, out of the realms of the Spirit, that is now actually on the level of written Scripture. So you can say, this is a dark period, 400 years. What period in time since Sinai was there a 400-year period of time where there was no prophet that there was any or judge that was a recorded, you know, event of God's divine intervention in Israel. There isn't one. I mean, like you get to Solomon, he says 480 years since the time we came up out of Egypt. Are you with me? So I'm talking about from Sinai all the way to this period. So notably, we're looking at a terrible spiritual decline. Otherwise, that wouldn't be the case. And... So, um, let me see if I can kind of now make a transition over into this worst period of time, the greatest, you know, the greatest apostasy and decline of spirituality during the Hasmonean period. And, and basically, this dynasty begins in 141 B.C. And so, you write that date down, and that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty agreed upon date. And then the only group that is left, there's this, always a remnant, and the only group that is left that is opposing the Hasmodeans are the only legitimate priest and, the, and those who are legitimately devoted to God under the tradition of what is classically understood of the legacy of Ezra, and that is the Hasidim, as I've already said, okay? Which Hasidim literally means righteous ones, pious ones. We call them ha Hasidics today, Hasidim has a long history, but they, the modern-day Hasidim reach back to this day, even though they're nothing like it, but as modern-day Hasidim rely upon the Talmud, which, once again, I'm building an argument to show you that this is, that, that what came into the oral tradition of the Talmud is absolutely, you know, debunked within the framework of it truly being a representation of the kingdom of God, and it, tr and it wasn't born until this period of time. Literally, out of this period of time, out of the Hasidim, arises three groups. The Sadducees, who once again are a group of people that are aristocrats, they're wealthy priests, okay? And um, then the Pharisees, who at, at this moment in time begin to um, create a, a doctrine and an idea that they can interpret the scripture and it be equal to the revelation of Sinai and thus we give birth to the oral tradition right here in the Hasmonean period. 
So maybe I'm not done the best of jobs of helping you see the decline of the spiritual state of Israel in these what we classically call this 400 years of silence. But I'm telling you, by the time we get to this point and we see a debunked high priest who's also acting as king, let me say this. Let me just interject. Were there still, is there still evidence that there were legitimate priests that were doing and carrying out the, the, their order and their 24 uh, legitimate uh, order of the priesthood uh, there were um, and that was actually going on even in the days of Jesus and we see that with Zechariah John's father so there's evidence that there were legitimate priests functioning within the framework of the legitimate temple and doing some form of legitimate worship within this one little you know class of Hasidim okay those who are committed to the rule of God but what is the biggest over Overwhelming and overreaching influence are these other groups like the Sadducees and like the Pharisees. And ultimately, you know, the Essenes don't really have that much influence. They become an important point to us and classic group to us in time because of the Qumran case, because the discovery took, took place in 1947, okay? But we know that they're a separate group of people because they recognize the evils and their testimony to us of the evils and the departure of both the Sanhedrin, of both, of both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who ultimately a Hasmonean queen, the mother of Alexander, uh, is going to uh, uh, institute as um, the, one of the ruling bodies of Israel, and she's going to side with the Pharisees because of their power and their authority of the time so that she has a legitimacy, and thus out of that she creates the Sanhedrin. She creates the Sanhedrin. God didn't create the Sanhedrin. She created the Sanhedrin. And I'm sure I wrote her name down here somewhere on it. Yeah, Queen Salome, Alexandria, okay, who was the mother of Alexandria Janus, okay? That he, that he was the guy who poured water out on his feet instead of pouring out upon the altar. Once again, basically deifying himself. His mother can't be a better um, saintly person than he is. Uh, usually, the guys learn from their mothers pretty well. And this is right around 76 B.C. And by this time now, the Pharisees are really coming to power. And they're, th th what emphasized them as a political group is the fact that of their legislative and judicial power is that they actually led a revolt against the Hasmonean rulership and leadership and um, it lasted for six years I think Josephus basically quantifies that something like 50,000 Jews are, are killed during this period of time but then out of that they emerged as an incredible force and an incredible power in Israel because Pompey comes in, sets up Roman rule, puts in Herod the Great as, uh, I guess you would refer to him as a vassal king under their authority. And now he gives uh, the Pharisees, basically, and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, you know, a, cert a, a whole lot of liberty to execute whatever it is they believe so that he can have a relative similitude of peace by allowing them to do their religious practices the way they saw fit. But understand, the way they saw fit was far from anything that Ezra would have done, far from anything that any of the prophets would have espoused, far from anything that Joshua would have done, far from anything that was delivered at Mount Sinai. They've got an entirely new way of looking at the Bible. It's called the oral tradition. And I just kind of give you some contrast in their social class. The Sadducees are the aristocracy priests, the rich priests. Okay, the Pharisees are the common, ordinary, everyday people, and the Essenes are what's left of the remnant of the Hasidim, the pious ones, that are trying to carry on some legitimate tradition of what the Bible really says. Okay, um, the Pharisees become known as the disciples of the wise, and of course, the Sadducees basically gain their authority because they're priests. Okay, they belong to the legitimate priesthood. Uh, the Essenes are become then known as the teachers of righteousness. That's pretty good, huh? Once again, why is that important? Because then we are able to understand that 
they truly are more of a pure line of the Hasidim. And we're trying to say, well, that would be the remnant of what's left there in Israel that was trying to truly carry on the, condition, the, 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 the tradition of the kingdom. But they, come, they be ultimately are, are, they become extinct. Okay? Um, basically, the, Sad, the Sadducees, who are the legitimate priests, are for Hellenization of Israel. Are you listening to me? They are basically bought in completely, totally, you know, in every respect, you know, with the order of success of the day. They did oppose the Hasmoneans. Why did they oppose the Hasmoneans? Because they weren't of the priesthood. They were non zadokites They weren't of the priesthood of Zadok. They could, have no tra they could not trace any Aaronite lineage whatsoever. They were illegitimate. So the Hasmoneans now got to rule over us and be the high priest and tell us basically what we can and cannot do. Um, and, of course, the Pharisees based, were more on the side of just, you know, they opposed at first. They, they had somewhat of an opposing Hasmodean. Then they kind of like formed a, a league with uh, the Hasmonean dynasty uh, for political advantage. And, but what they were more interested in was the authority, the kingly authority, and they opposed the Hasmoneans as, as being kings. Just trying to give you a, excuse me, a feel for that. Um, then, uh, as far as an oral Torah or an oral tradition, the Sadducees were very strong and there was no such thing. <laughs> Whereas the Pharisees were already, think about this, already by clearly by 70 B.C. proclaiming that the oral tradition was equal to the written Torah. Now, if I can make a better case for you to show you how influenced these Pharisees are by Greek culture, by Persian culture, by Babylonian culture, prior to, you know, the, the diaspora of 70 A.D. and 132 A.D., which then is going to become even worse because the oral tradition is not actually ever going to be written down, keep this in mind, for 270 years later. If we start the Pharisaic period at 70 A.D., and that would be about the time that they led the revolt to, against the Hasmoneans, okay? Um, then it would be 270 years later that they would actually start writing out the Talmud. And by this time, they're in Babylon, they're in Persia, and now their most, they, their greatest affinity to the religious belief system of the day is Zoroastrianism, because of all of the various different, you know, counterparts that have some sort of equivalency to the things that God revealed about Himself in, in the Bible, uh, they really had a lot of affinity and. I think most all historians say that the influence of, of the second century to I think fourth century, almost fifth century, of and this is A.D. of the Persian and Babylonian religions, namely and most importantly Zoroastrianism, radically changed the view and insight of rabbinic teachers, and this is where this is all coming from. Once again, I want you to understand. You'll hear it over and again. Rabbinic teachings. Okay, right now, Israel, on the religious side, is ruled by the rabbinic council. Okay, and they got a, really a, a very different view of how things should be uh, than what the Word of God espouses. So, I mean, I can also make an argument that, yes, do I believe that, that Israel, as it stands right now, is, is a revival and a token of what God is going to do in the future? Yes, I don't have a problem with that. There's a lot of miracle in that, but there is a lot of illegitimacy in it because it's secular, it's not religious, and when we want to try, and what happens is people are always trying to take and in, superimpose upon Israel a religious intent, a religious notion. It's not. It's secular. And so when we look at the bi biblical understanding of Israel and the, re in the, in the bringing back and reformation and revival of Israel, we're looking at it from a religious point of view. We're not looking at it from a so secular point of view. And so, you know, also in this, I'm saying that so much of what's been developed now because of this total spiritual decline 
this Roman and Greek influence, and let's just say Roman, because ultimately the Romans are going to take over, and they're going to take over in a transition between the Hasmonean period and the, and the, the period uh, of the, the Herodian period, a period of, of the rule of Herod the Great and his descendants. Um, what, what's going on there is really a testimony to the rule of Daniel's vision of the giant with two iron legs, the eastern and the western divisions of Rome. And we can still see that authority dominating in, within the religious structure of Israel because of the influences, especially, once again, as they were, you know, uh, put forth and, and embraced, once again, in the Hasmonean period, then that much more in the Herodian period. And remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He said, your father's the devil. That is a radical des description of who the Pharisees are. These are the guys who started their oral tradition, and now people are going to go to Israel from the church and learn about the five cups of, of Passover? Hello? Wait a minute. Where did they get that from? They got that from the oral tradition of the Pharisees out of a, out of the, out of a Haggadah concerning uh, the Seder or the Passover. Are you with me? So I'm, I'm hoping I'm making a point that all of these things that people are espousing now, especially within the framework of Christianity and within the framework of exegesis and saying that we're going to have to go and rely on extra biblical sources and culture uh, of the period and the time to really understand what scripture is saying is invalid because we're having to look through the lens now of those who've changed the culture and changed the sociology and change the, the whole understanding of who God is and literally Greekized it and there then became people who were champions of that like the Hasmoneans. Aren't you, are you telling me that the high priest uh, uh, being a Hasmonean didn't have influence there? That the Pharisees who were Greekized and gave themselves over to, to so much influence in the Greek culture isn't going to change that? Then you get a champion like Philo who then actually integrates yeah, Greek religion with Jewish tradition, which has already totally declined by the time he comes on the scene in 30 BC. So hopefully I'm making my point that ultimately what we're going to get out of the Talmud is certainly nowhere near anything that is equal to the written scripture of the Bible. And yet we have pastors, even in Pentecostal denominations like Assemblies of God, not just pastors, but theologians, telling us that we need to give ourselves to the study of the Mishnah and the Gemara so we can more perfectly understand the will of God and have divine spiritual insight into what's going on. That is absolutely wrong on every account. And by the help of the grace of God, I'm going to get better at laying forth, putting forth the proofs um, so that everybody can see that and not just do it as quickly as I feel like I have to do it now within the framework of, you know, of, of, a, of, a, of a class and, and, and the format that we're using. Just kind of real summarize this real quickly. Um, the most important groups that I want you to remember that came out of the Hasmonean period. What did the Hasmonean period produce? What was the fruit of the Hasmonean period? I hope I made the Hasmonean period totally illegitimate, not a revival, but an apostasy. The great groups that came out of that, the great fruit of that was Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes. Essenes, by default, which separated and said, well, we disagree with both, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, you know, then, you know, I want to point out just John, um, who was the next big leader in Hasmonean, in the Hasmonean period was fully Hellenized by 113 BCE. Just a point of fact. Um, he was basically freed from Seleucid domination, was allowed to be the king, and it was the king and high priest, I mean, why not wear every hat, who enlarged the kingdom of Israel, as it were, beyond the boundaries that had been confined to by the Seleucid Empire. Um, then Alexander comes along, 94. 
um, and I try to sh just point out the, apost the apostate acts of this Hellenized Hasmonean. Um, he's the guy who poured out the water upon his feet instead of the altar, making himself somehow more deified. Um, and of course, the Pharisees, they started the school uh, of rabbis. And a good reason why Jesus said, don't let anybody call you rabbi, because this is where it's first started. School of rabbis started by the Pharisees. Right, right about that, right around in that same time period, and that's when they led a revolt. Pharisees ultimately joined league with the mother of, um, of Alexander, the Hasmonean king and high priest. And um, that's a right around uh, 76 BC, right around in that period of time. And so that's why then at, right at 70 BCE, we call that the Pharisee period because they come really to be the most influential body of folks okay, in Israel, and remain so. Um, they become more influential and remain so. And, and um, the scribes are right, right alongside of them, boistering their position, and we understand what Jesus said about them and how he referred to them basically through their, keep, the, through their pursuit of keeping their own tradition. Then they, you know, make void, literally, right? That's what he said. You, you nullify that if I could get a more strong counter argument to why we don't need insight from the Talmud, I don't believe that there is one. Jesus saying, through your tradition to the Pharisees, which is the oral tradition, you have made void the law and the commandment of God. Can anybody, hello, testing. Okay, so basically he that has ears to hear, hears, and everybody wants to be of their, you know, their, the opinion that they had, you know, uh, and, and not be persuaded against their will, then there's nothing I can do. But I do challenge everybody within earshot of me who's willing to hear. You need to review these facts, look at this, and understand that when somebody comes along and begins to say in this day and time, that their oral tradition, their belief, their interpretation, and wild, not even close, somehow is equal to the Bible, what are you going to do with them? Well, um, it's happening. It's happening. It's slowly happening. The water, for, the, you know, the water is slowly warming on the toad. Are you with me? And nobody knows or discerns what's happening. But by and large, those people who are consecrated to the Word of God are going to say, that's absolutely not legitimate. They're going to have the same response and be as radical as the Lord Jesus Christ is about it. So um, we'll get more into the decline, spiritual decline under the Herodian period um, next time. And I'll be, then begin to bring out some more issues um, concerning um, the effects of the scribes and the influence of, um, uh, of Philo and try to get us to the point of 70 A.D. by that next lecture because I need to spend at least, you know, three, two or three lectures just on the period of actually when the Talmud was being written in the second century. Love all of you. Until next time. Anybody want to ask any questions? I will. Yeah.